Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Dr. Rena Malik here, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, I'm gonna to be reacting to The Good Doctor. It's okay, sweetie. What's your name? That's Marla. No one to leave her with. I'm gonna take care of you, mommy. Oh. Oh. Abdomen oh. tender and distended, dehydrated, delayed capillary refill. Rapid respiratory rate, skin cool and bluish, looks cyanotic. She's going into shock. We need aggressive fluid resuscitation. So our broad spectrum antibiotics place an NG to decompress distended abdomen. Transfer lactates, initiate complete sepsis bundle. All right, so first and foremost, that woman looks way too good to be in sepsis. She comes in there looking basically totally fine and all of a sudden starts hyperventilating. That's really not how it happens. Typically when someone comes in really ill with sepsis, they look really, really bad. You can tell from far away that something is really wrong with them. She looked totally fine coming into that emergency room bay. Also, her daughter is so cute. What a good little actress. Like she, her facial expressions are phenomenal, on point. The ultrasound showed your colon is distended. We placed a rectal tube and an NG to try to get that decompressed. Mommy, can we go home? Not yet, sweetie. That would be helpful to try to find out what could have triggered this. Any history of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? No. I, um, I have had some UTIs lately. It's likely not connected. Diverticulitis? Any recent international travel? I have a three-year-old and no husband. Okay. We're going to need to keep you on IV antibiotics and monitor the distension. Yeah, so again, she looks way too well. If somebody was in sepsis, they wouldn't just all of a sudden look better after getting an NG tube and some fluids. Not that much better. She looks basically fine, except she, first she has an NG tube taped to her nose. So an NG tube is a tube that goes through your nose down into your stomach to help decompress. We typically use it for people when they have severe abdominal distension or they have really bloated abdomen and we're concerned that there's a risk for post-surgical complications for people who've had surgery or risk for perforation for people who have other conditions. So I see how they're bringing up some sort of urologic issue here where she did ask about UTIs, but I don't see how- Can I just leave her with you? I'm a receptionist, not a social worker. And I'm a surgeon. I didn't mean I'm more important. I just meant we both have more important things to do. When will the social worker be here? She said half an hour. Can you page her again? I want my mom. Why don't you just go play with the toys, okay? Do you have her number? I'll call her myself. So this is very frustrating because this sort of thing actually happens pretty often in the hospital where a young resident, like even when I was in residency, you would go tell a female who was, you know, in rank technically below you uh, to do something to help you and they would put up a big front about doing their job but then a male resident might come along and ask for the same thing and they'd run to do it for them. So this happens all the time. It's very, very frustrating. And you know, I like to think that people are generally and inherently good, but there is gender bias that goes on all the time in everywhere, not just the hospital system. And I really hope that we can work together to change this and change people's implicit biases and gender biases and racial biases and sexual biases because everyone is just trying to do the best they can with the tools that they have. And, and we don't know what is going on with anyone else and what their personal life is like. So I think we should all just try to be kinder to one another. Okay, I'm gonna get off my soapbox so we can continue the medicine part. I made mommy sick. No, sweetie, it's not your fault. Sometimes people just get mommy sick. Mommy drunk my poop. Your mommy drew your poop? No. Jock, mommy, jock. Drank? Yes, mommy drank my poop. That's disgusting. I've heard of people doing all sorts of crazy things to cure their UTIs, so maybe this is where they're going with that, but this is extreme. I have never seen anything like this, nor do I really want to, so please don't drink your poop. I, I didn't drink it. I just, I just used her stool to do a home fecal transfer. And you didn't think to mention that? I, you said my UTIs were unrelated. I, they didn't get better with antibiotics, so I did exactly what I was supposed to do. The video swore that it was completely safe. 
What video? Make sure your friend is completely healthy. I've had the best who, results who with Who is vegans. that? Though, if it were between an 18-year-old carnivore and a 60-year-old vegan, well, don't make me choose. Then we're gonna add the saline solution. Oh my God. Should be a one-to-one -one match, oh more God. or less. Then, we're gonna puree, <laughs> puree, and then puree some more. While it's mixing, let's talk enema bags. Marla must have seen her using the blender. Assume she drank it. Yeah, that's the mystery here, not how anyone this stupid is still alive. It's not completely irrational. The E. coli strain and drug-resistant UTIs can hide out in the gut. No, it's Repopulating irrational. the colon microbiome using FMT has shown some success. In a hospital under control and sterile conditions. Prepper for surgery. Between the dilation and rigidity, there may be colon perforation. And test Marla's stool for toxins and infectious bacteria. All right, we have a lot to unpack here. First of all, they're saying that she has a rigid abdomen and needs to go to surgery. This is called peritonitis. So typically when we examine patients who come in with abdominal symptoms, if they have what's called peritonitis or their abdomen is extremely tender to touch or motion, the trick that we sometimes use is we'll move the bed of the patient and see if that recreates the pain and that tells us that they have peritonitis. But one, I haven't seen any sort of abdominal exam during this whole episode. And number two, she looks totally fine. If somebody really had peritonitis or a rigid abdomen that needed surgery, they would look miserable and super uncomfortable. But regardless, they're moving forward with that. Now, secondly, moving to the fecal transfer. Fecal transfer has only been studied in a very small subset of patients and mostly for patients who have a colonic infection called Clostridium difficile or C. diff for short. And so they were getting the fecal transfer for that purpose. And then they also looked at their urinary tract infections. And that other doctor is completely right that these things are done under very controlled settings. So the feces that are used are screened extensively. The patient who's undergoing the transfer undergoes a full washout of their colon before they get the transfer. This is not something that anybody should try at home. I want to take a minute here and talk about recurrent UTIs. I see these all the time. What should you do if you're antibiotic is not working? And what exactly is a recurrent UTI? When should you go see your doctor? So recurrent urinary tract infection is when you've had three urinary tract infections in one year or two within six months. And these should be proven with a culture. So when you typically go to the doctor's office, you'll get your urine dipped in a urine dipstick. These are not sensitive and specific enough to definitively diagnose a urinary tract infection in every patient. So if you're having recurrent infections, the most important thing to do is to get a urine culture and confirm that there's actually bacteria there. There are a lot of things that can masquerade as recurrent urinary tract infections. Overactive bladder is one of them, and you can watch my video on five easy things to improve your overactive bladder if you have those symptoms. And you can also just have a bladder that's somewhat irritated based on what you drank or ate. So you can check out my video on bladder irritants that talks about things that irritate the bladder. But there are a number of different things that can masquerade as symptoms of a urinary tract infection. And what are those symptoms? They can be urgency or having to rush to the bathroom, this gotta go, gotta go. They can be frequency or having to go to the bathroom very, very often. And they can be dysuria or having pain when you urinate, like a burning pain when you urinate. They can also be kind of super pubic pain or pain in the lower part of the abdomen where your bladder sits or pressure. And sometimes people can have fever or flank pain or pain in their back. So those are symptoms that typically arise when you have a urinary tract infection. But what are things that you should do if you have a UTI before you would ever do anything crazy like a fecal transfer? You can drink a lot of fluid. So you wanna drink about two to three liters of fluid every day. So that's water and things that don't irritate your bladder. If you don't like water, you can add some flavoring to the water, but you wanna to try to avoid really a lot of sugary drinks because one, those are bad for your health, and two, they can also irritate the bladder lining. Number two, you wanna make sure that you're emptying your bladder completely. So when you go to the bathroom, you wanna sit comfortably and completely empty your bladder, and you wanna make sure you're not holding your bladder for long periods of time because the longer the urine sits in your bladder, the more likely it is to get infected. And also take note of when this is happening. Some people can have urinary tract infections 
information related to sex, related to travel or things like that. So kind of pay attention. Is something happening in your life before you get a urinary tract infection? And is that pretty consistent? So there's a lot of talk about cranberry juice. Does cranberry juice really help? Well, it's not the actual juice itself that helps. It's the cranberry extract called proanthocyanidines or PACs. So you want to make sure that you're getting enough PACs and the dosage I recommend to my patients is 36 milligrams. So I have them take tablets that say that they have 36 milligrams of PACs inside of them to make sure that they're getting the right dose. And you want to take one tablet a day and that can help prevent infections. For women who are postmenopausal, getting estrogen cream and putting it in the vaginal area twice a week at night can actually help prevent infections. And that's been proven in studies. So it's actually very, very helpful if you are after menopause and having recurrent UTIs to get a prescription for estrogen. The times you should not ignore a UTI is if you are pregnant, if you are a man, or if you are a child. These are groups of people that need to see their primary care provider or a urologist if they're getting urinary tract infections because it's not typical for those people to get infections. And in pregnant women, it actually can be very dangerous. So make sure that for those of you who fall into that category, you get checked out immediately. Late and divide middle colic artery in vain. It's an epidemic. People taking online medical advice. It's not the problem, it's the symptom. Medical care is a financial stress for lots of people, not to mention physician arrogance, incompetence, impatience. So it's our fault? Resect and cut the colon proximal and distal to the perforation with GIA staple. Friend of a friend self-diagnosed her own Cushing's disease online after a series of doctors barely listened to her, told her to get more rest. I'm guessing she didn't then perform do-it-yourself brain surgery at home. Claire's right. I was supporting your point. She convinced me I was wrong. Dr. Melinda? Wait, she's not wearing scrubs wait. and she's not wearing not a scrub sure. cap. The fecal sample that your team sent me... It might be normal, but was it mislabeled? It seems to be from a 70-year-old. It's from a three-year-old. SCFAs, elevated isobutyric and isovaleric acid. She is at high risk for serious cardiac problems. One, just to briefly comment on that last part. So she is not supposed to come into the OR without scrubs, without covering her hair. She's wearing the mask, great, but the OR is a sterile environment, and so you can't just walk in there. Also, usually a pathologist, which I assume that's what she is, pathologists don't come to the OR, they just call. They usually call and tell you whatever sample you sent and whatever the results are, if they're urgent or they'll page you, but they don't really come to find you in the operating room. That would take forever. So that's one thing. And two, I'm not sure why they ran those tests on the stool. I thought they were just checking for infection. So I think this is all for drama, of course, and to find out what's wrong with this woman's daughter, which is really sad. But ultimately, I think that's that's what's going on. As far as the conversation that they had, I agree that there is a rampant amount of medical misinformation on the internet. In fact, I even did a study on this looking at the different types of videos available for pelvic organ prolapse. And the rate of misinformation was not insignificant. And I think that it's really important to know where you're getting your medical misinformation from. I mean, even lately, we've been getting medical misinformation from people like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz. And those are people that the American population considers to be reputable resources. So I think it's really important to see what sources they're using to get their information from. I typically try to link all the articles that I use in my description below so that you can access them and everything else is really coming from my training that I do day to day. I can't stress this enough. It's very important to check your sources, verify where they're getting their information from before you try to do something that could hurt you or harm you. It's very important on your end to do research, talk to people and get your own information. But please don't take action without talking to somebody. Go see a physician in person and get some information. As far as doctors ignoring patients, absolutely. It happens all the time. And it's really a shame and it's really sad. And I talk a little bit about this in my reaction to John Oliver's video, Bias in Healthcare. So check that out as well. And I think all of us, doctors, patients, could do a better job of 
being honest, open, taking time to listen and process the information that we're given. All right, well, I hope you learned something about urinary tract infections and how to find accurate medical information. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments below, particularly where do you go to find your medical information? Because I'm really curious to find out where people find their information. I've been actually looking at different podcasts, YouTube videos, obviously, Pinterest posts, Instagram apps in a research setting to see where are people finding information and how much of it is accurate and what exactly does it say? Because I think this is really important and people are on social media trying to find medical information. So let me know. I really want to know where you're finding your information. And always remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.